Hallelujah. Are you ready for the word? Are you hungry for the word this morning? Are you hungry for a word from the Lord? Hallelujah. I've been seeking God in regards to this message this morning. I believe that the Lord has a word for us. Amen. And I believe he's going to speak to us. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. I've come to magnify the Lord. What about you? I've come to feel his presence. What about you? Hallelujah. We have to be careful sometimes on Mother's Day and Father's Day and Memorial Day and Fourth of July and all these special events that we build ourselves around that. And sometimes we can get so into that that we can lose out on, on speaking the word of God and the anointing into those that are here that need it. Somebody with me. I want to look at the theme this morning, the responsibility of a great father. I said the responsibility of a great father. Would all the fathers please stand for just a moment as I give you recognition. All the dads, fathers, men that's poured into somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. I'm mindful of my dear brother Mark Hunt. Mark, would you stand for a moment? I want people to see who you are. Mark had come through a battle with cancer, a battle that, uh, that he fought a good fight. But I want you to know something. Mark came up the other, just a few moments ago to tell me, Pastor, I just came back from the doctor. Now, he's been through all the things it takes. And he came back, and the doctor said he's cancer-free. He can see. He can drive. And everything's back where it needs to be. God bless you, Mark. Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise God. And he's got his sight back. He couldn't see at all. He couldn't drive. He's got his sight back. He drives his truck, and he's back on track. Do what, Mark? Put on six pounds since last Sunday. We serve a healing Jesus. Amen. I want to look at the theme of... of Responsibility of great fathers, and you'll know why I'm going to title this in a few moments, Great Fathers. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 18 and verse 17. We're going to get right into the word quickly this morning. Genesis chapter 18 and verse 17. Here's what it says. Seeing that Abraham shall sh surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed to him. <clears throat> For I know him that he will command his children. Now listen, this is, this is, the, uh, this is the thing uh, that, that separates Abraham uh, from the rest. This is what makes him a great father, uh, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment uh, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. Is anybody with me? Have you ever noticed? Now listen, please. I, I, I just want to, I'm going to run a comparison for a moment. Please listen to me. Have you ever noticed that on Mother's Day, we tell mothers how great they are? We go to the scriptures and find the great mothers and compare them. Am I right? <clears throat> There's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. Amen. And we all love mothers and we tell mothers how great they are. And then on Father's Day, we tell the fathers what they need to do to be great. We bring out all of our weaknesses. We tell all the things that we don't do right. And we encourage them to please come for prayer that they could be great. Now, is that true or not? Fathers, it's almost as if Mothers automatically became great, while fathers must continually work at it. Huh? I don't know about you men, but I felt that way in time past. There's a number of distractions or a number of descriptions given to fathers, and here they are. Can I give you a few things that, that, that separates fathers and puts us in a category that we recognize who we are. Here it is. Number one, a father is a person who growls when he feels good and laughs very loud when he's scared. 
A father's a person who gets very angry uh, when the school grades aren't as good as he thinks they should be. A father is a person who hurries away from the breakfast table off to the arena, uh, which sometimes is called an office, and there with calloused hands, he tackles the dragons of four heads, which is weariness, which is work, which is fear of failure, and which is competition. Amen, said one man. A father is a person who gives his daughter a man who isn't nearly good enough. Okay, but listen, but listen, I'll finish it now that I had response. He's a person who gives his daughter a man who isn't nearly good enough so he can have grandchildren that are better than anyone else's. <laughs> a dad is a fellow who has replaced the currency in his wallet with snapshots of his family. Amen? Do we know who this man is now? Someone has said, I believe it is, and I believe it's true, uh, uh, that a boy loves his mother, but he follows his father. Isn't that true? A boy loves his mother, but he follows his father. Here's some of the attributes that are important that places a tremendous responsibility on fathers. Fathers, we have a, a great responsibility. Biblically, we have a great responsibility. I'm not here to condemn anybody and tell you what you should be. I'm here to, to make a declaration of what a great father is. And I'll tell you, you wouldn't be sitting here if you wasn't in the category of great fathers. You bring your people, you, you bring your family to church. Your children are over here in junior church because you care enough about your children to bring them in the house of God. Uh, you, uh, you, you recognize the power of prayer in your home. And you recognize you can't walk this Christian life alone. You must have Jesus to be Lord of your life. Amen? So here's the responsibility. First of all, he's a leader. God places every man in leadership. Father has to take his rightly spot as a leader. The second thing, he's told to leave his parents. Scripture said, leave your father and your mother and cleave your wife. Uh, we have to leave uh, the environment uh, that we were accustomed to and move into the environment of our own, environment of leadership, environment uh, to take charge of the things uh, that God has put in your care. Amen. And then we've given the responsibility to teach our children so they learn. Teach them the right things. I like that song that we sang, Somebody's Watching You. Somebody's Watching Me. Somebody's Watching Us All the Time. And then, we, uh, and then we've been given, the father's been given the responsibility to lead his home, to lead his household, to lead his children into the right things, to lead his family and his wife where they should be. Well, pastor, I can't lead my home. Uh, my wife want, wants to run things. And maybe she does because you haven't taken the place. A lot of women are taking their place and, and doing what they have to do. But men, it's our job to step up to the plate and say, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord, as Joshua said. Amen. And then a father is one that loves his wife as Christ loves the church. I said loves his wife as Christ loves the church and gave himself for her. Amen. Is anybody with me? Yes, and let me say this uh, to all of you men. I commend you. I applaud, I, I, I applaud you today. I recognize the responsibility that we have as men, and it's not always easy. In the midst of all the things and responsibilities and the pressures that's on us, that we still have to walk in the integrity and, and keep ourselves in such, a, in, in such a relationship that we walk in the anointing of God and we're respected and honored by our family and our children and we're respected by those that are around us because we are men of God. Amen. I said because we're men of God. There's some things I would like to mention about a fatherhood. Number one, number one, you want to write these things down. I'm probably going to teach more than preach this morning. And number one, a father should be a provider. Mickey has taught this in, in many of her classes when she, taught, when she teaches the women and teaches the responsibility of a man. But listen, men, it is our responsibility to be a provider. We need not slack when it comes to provision. We need not hold back when it comes to our responsibility as a father and as a man of God and a man of integrity. Amen? Amen. The father is charged uh, with providing for his family. It's given a charge to us. 
In fact, Paul says that if a man will not provide for his own, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. An infidel is an unbeliever. Worse than one is uh, the, the, worse than somebody that denies who God is. Paul told us in Thessalonians that if a man would not work, neither should he eat. Amen. So it's this, so it's it, it's a man's responsibility to do everything we possibly can to shoulder the the the, the uh, responsibility of being a provider. It's the, it's the, the father's responsibility to provide food and shelter for his family. The entrance of sin into life meant that men had to earn his living by the sweat of his brow. It was a curse that was put on, on Adam. He was told because uh, you allowed the, uh, the woman to beguile you, because you uh, fell under the temptation uh, of Eve, uh, this is what's going to happen. Uh, you're going to work, uh, but you're going to work by the sweat of your brow. It's not going to be easy. How many of you notice when you get out in this, in, in this uh, humid heat like we had yesterday that you don't have to even hardly work. Just sit around and you'll break out in the sweat. Amen. And you start to do a little something and, you're, and, and, and the sweat of your brow starts to break out. Uh, that's uh, part of the curse that was given uh, to Adam. But I want you to know uh, that when you work for your wife, when you work for your children, when you work for your family, I want you to know something. Uh, God has a way of turning, uh, turning a, a, a drudgery a job into joy. It's always been a joy to uh, provide for my family. It's always been a joy uh, to be able to uh, be the need meter and a provider for my wife and my children. It's, it, it's always been something that, uh, that in my heart I was glad to do. God gave us a two-edged sword. He allowed uh, us to turn labor into joy. We know that labor is hard. We know it puts our bodies under strain. Uh, we know there's times we say, is there any other way? But then the other side of the sword is, uh, praise God, I have a job. Praise God, I can take care of my family. Praise God that God chose me to be the provider for my household. So I wanted, I'm speaking to great fathers this morning. It's a privilege of providing for your family. It's a privilege this meant some deep inner need in a man uh, that has within him. Uh, most men, uh, there, uh, there's something down inside that we're designed, uh, we're designed to produce. We're designed to uh, be profitable. We're designed uh, to be able to do something that will touch somebody's life and make a difference. And that's where the joy comes from. The privilege to provide for my family. It was never a drudgery. It's never been something, do I have to? No, I get to. Are you with me? I get to be a provider. I get to make sure I meet the needs of my household. I get to be able to see my wife uh, have joy in her heart and have some of the things uh, that every man wants to see their wife have. It's been a joy to see my children uh, being able to uh, walk in the anointing of God and be able to, uh, to live their life. And now as they've grown up and they are, uh, they have, uh, they are, they're married now, have their own children, that now uh, they follow the pattern uh, that they want to provide and, and, and they want to have husbands that, are, that, that provide for their family. And the, and the process goes on from one generation to the other because we set the pace. Is anybody with me so far? The new birth, being born again, it's in the presence of Christ. It's a man's heart that changes uh, the work from weariness uh, to something wonderful. I said it's because of Jesus Christ uh, that I can have the joy and say, uh, this isn't drudgery. This, it might be hard work. It might be by the sweat of my brow. It might be something that's uncomfortable at times, uh, but there's something down deep inside of me that gives me joy because I'm serving God and I'm walking with him and he's given me the strength to be all that I need to be. The scripture for this is Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Jesus said, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden. Is anybody with me? And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and I am lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. 
I found out when I'm yoked up with the Lord, when I'm connected, I'm shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. I want you to know uh, the, uh, the work is easy. Uh, the, uh, the burden is light. I can walk through life with victory. But when I decide I'm going to uh, pull out from away from him and get out on my own and, and start to pull the load on my own, then it becomes wearisome and heavy and hard because I can't operate without Jesus in my life. Is anybody with me? So not only should we be a provider, but the second thing, we ought to be the protector. Men are called to be protectors. In the Garden of Eden, God told Adam, says, guard the garden. Guard the garden. Are you with me? That means if you're told to guard the garden, there must be an enemy around. If you're told to protect something, then there must be a threat that some thing or, 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 or some outside force could come in and, and, and create havoc in the midst of your control zone. We are told to protect our family and protect the, uh, the anointing and protect our children and protect the realm of power that God has given us. Amen? Families need a, 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 an authority figure. Children need to see dads walking circumspectly. Wives need to see their and know their husbands are, are, are walking in such a manner. Does that mean we're perfect? No. Does that mean we have struggles? Yes, we do. Uh, but my, des my desire, my connection with God is, Lord, help me uh, to be uh, the protector and to be the person that I need to be and set the example for my children and my wife that, God, that your anointing could flow through this family. I can be the head, and it'll be like the oil that ran down Aaron's beard and the bottom of his garment. Uh, so uh, shall the anointing uh, from the priesthood be. Amen. Are you with me? It always runs from the top. Families need an authority figure. Let me give you a few statistics. The lack of godly fathers that can be seen in our society today. Can I give you a few, uh, a, a, a few shocking statistics? I'm talking, about, I'm talking about what's going on among our teenagers, among our young people, is suicide, drug abuse, alcoholism, uh, sex, uh, uh, the sexual uh, promiscuity uh, is an epidemic among our teenagers. Is it okay if we say these things in church? I mean, the world's talking about it all the time. Amen? The world don't mind telling us what the statistics are, and we come to church and fold our hands, lift our hands and cry holy. Don't want to ever say anything about these things because, after all, that's in the world. Uh, but I want you to know uh, we have the power and the anointing within the church uh, to line up with the Word of God and stop some of these things that's happening in our society. It's estimated that 20 Teenagers attempt to end their lives every 30 minutes. Are you with me? We've been church for a little over an hour, and that means there's been 40 teenagers that's already attempted to take their lives during the time we've been in this service. Approximately 685 teens become drug users every 30 minutes. Some 23 teenage girls have abortions every 30 minutes over our land. More than 3 million American teenagers have been treated uh, for alcoholism since 1980. We think that it's not there. Uh, we ignore it. We, uh, we want to pretend it's not happening to us. We want to pretend it's not going to happen to our family. But if I had a raise of hands, I could say, how many of you, in, I'm not going to do it, but how many of you have had a, a, a situation where a teenager or a young person in your own family has had an addiction problem and had to go get some help? And there would be hands raised. I'm not asking you to raise your hand. But I'm saying it's prevalent. It's for real. Is somebody with me? About 9,000 teenagers are killed each year from drunk driving. From driving drunk. Are you with me? How many of you know it sounds like uh, we, have, uh, we have some, uh, some things that, uh, that, that's missing in the home because it starts in the home. It starts in our leadership. It starts in setting the example. Fathers, uh, to be uh, worthy and to be willing to accept the responsibility. I charge every father in this house to be willing to accept the responsibility that God has placed on us. And I say, let's take it with victory. Let's take the responsibility as fathers. Let's take the responsibility uh, to be dads. I said it earlier in the service. A father isn't just somebody uh, that can produce a child. Are you with me? 
Just because somebody says, well, oh, I got a son or I got a daughter, I was able to, I, I, I was ever able to have a relationship with a woman and now I got a child. Uh, that, doesn't, uh, that, that doesn't necessarily designate a person as a great father. A great father is what do they do with that child after the child's born? What kind of influence do we have? What kind of impartation are we giving? Uh, what kind of example are we setting? What kind of godly uh, uh, structure do we have? As Joshua said, as for me and my house. He didn't say as for me. He said as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen? Wives were commanded to be, uh, to, by God to give this uh, respect uh, to your husbands. Uh, listen, uh, a, a lot of times there's, there's a lot of men that are struggling trying to find identity and trying to find their leadership position because they've never been given uh, the opportunity to do it. Ladies, listen. Wives, listen. If you can't trust your husband enough to give him leadership in the home, he'll never be able to be what God wants him to be. On the other hand, man, you have to prove yourself worthy enough to take that responsibility. When I married Mickey, she had four children, and I had one. And, and at 27 years old, I was a father of, uh, of five and teenagers. And I tell you what, for the first, uh, for the first few, few, few uh, months in our marriage, it, it, it was a little bit rocky because uh, there was a lot of things that I would tell them children to do or I would, I, I, I would act as a 27-year-old father to, uh, to teenagers. I didn't have a whole lot of experience myself in that area, and she wasn't going to give me a whole lot of rain until she trusted me enough to do the right thing with those kids. We can't act like little boys when we're men. We can't expect to still do all the stuff that we did when we were single now that we've got the responsibility of a family. Can't be running out with the boys and hanging out and buying more toys when we can't afford it and we can't even pay the electric bill, but we're going to go out and buy something else we want to play with. Let me tell you, that's childish stuff. It's time for men to grow up and take the responsibility and show our wives, listen, you can trust me. I'm a man of integrity. I'm a man that hears from God. I'm a man that puts my family first besides God in my life. Thank you for those three amens. Wives, submit yourself to your husband, it says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22 and 23, or, 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 or 522, wives, submit yourself to your husbands as to the Lord. And then in verse 33, it says, wives, see to it that you reverence or respect your husband. And sometimes you got to do that by faith. Ladies, sometimes you got to do it by faith, especially if it's a second marriage. Especially if you've already been hurt one time by somebody and you've got this wall up and you're not really uh, think that you can trust anybody so you're, uh, so you're just feeling your way through. Uh, there's going to have to be a time that you're going to have to leave the hurts and the wounds down. There's going to have to be a time that you're going to have to be willing to be hurt again if you can love again. Thank you. Hallelujah. So we need to be the providers. Amen. I mean protectors. We need to be protectors. Okay, the third thing is, uh, men, uh, if we're going to be great men of God and great fathers, uh, we, need to be, uh, we need to be the ones uh, that exercises discipline. We need to be the discipliners. A lot of uh, children don't understand the authority of their dad because he lets mom do all the correcting. And he comes home, he's the, he's the hero. The little the children jump into his arms and he don't want to get on them. He don't want to say anything that they don't like. He don't want to hurt their precious little feelings because he's only there for a couple of hours. And he goes back to work the next day and mom has to deal with it all day long. Listen, don't leave, Kenny. <laughs> don't leave, Kenny, I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding with you, Kenny. We need to understand, man, it's our responsibility to take our place. Mom shouldn't have to be always correct and always disciplined. You know why? Because the authority needs to be passed down uh, from the head of the household. We need to deal with these kind of things. Proverbs 13, 24 says, He who spares his rod hates his son. That's what the word says. He who spares the rod hates his son or his daughter, whatever the case may be. But he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Discipline will always bring a good result as long as we discipline correctly. 
Dads, we have a responsibility to be uh, the disciplinarians and, and discipliners, uh, but there's some things that we need to understand about this discipline thing. Number one, never punish your child when you're angry. Because when you're angry, you're going to operate on your own emotions. And when you operate on your own emotions, many times you go beyond the limit. And when you go beyond the limit, you've already broke the spirit of the child. You see, we shouldn't, we shouldn't ever operate in anger. We ought to keep ourselves under control when it comes to disciplining our children. And then here, here's another important thing. Whether, it's, whether you're disciplining or whether you're not, there's a proper time to, to, to make compliments. We need to compliment our children at the right time. Don't put your children down. There's been many a child that's been ruined because the parents use statements like this. You're stupid and you'll always be stupid. You never can do anything right. Let me tell you, that'll ruin a child. Uh, that'll hurt a child's uh, spirit. Uh, you'll break a spirit of a child and they'll, and they'll start to believe that. They'll start to believe they can't do anything right. And then you'll find out on down the road, uh, they're not listening to you. They're finding their friends out in the street. Uh, they're finding their friends at the 7-Eleven and they're some of the ones that, that get, get caught up in the statistics that we talked about. Number three, criticize uh, your child's behavior at the right time. Criticize, if you're going to criticize, don't criticize the child. Criticize the behavior. Is anybody with me this morning? Then remember criticism. Remember uh, to criticize the behavior. Don't criticize the child. Don't fault the child. Don't tell the child they're no good. Don't tell the child that they'll never make it. Don't tell the child uh, that they're always going to be that way. Listen, you can make or break the attitude and the future of a child's spirit by the way we address them. Be a disciplinarian. Discipline, discipline the children. Uh, and and, and they'll, they'll come back to you one day and they'll say thank you. And then the other thing is we need to be a pattern. If we're going to be great fathers, we need to be a pattern. We sang the song uh, uh, about the man uh, that, uh, that went into the barn and, say, and, and started to pray. And he went into the bedroom and his son was on his knees praying. He said, where did you learn how to do that? He said, by watching you, Dad. Man was on his way to a tavern one day. When he looked behind him, he saw his son following him. Listen to this. Look, Dad, the boy ex ex explained. I'm following your footsteps. The dad immediately turned around and went back to the house and didn't go back to the bar, didn't go back to the bar again. The son was following his dad to the bar. You can say, well, it don't make any difference to the little boy. He's, a, he's, he's not allowed to drink. He, I'll tell you what, the example is being set. The pattern is being shown. Are you with me? There was a congregation one time that found uh, that, uh, found that were both parents uh, were, where both parents were faithful in the things of God. 93% of the kids remain faithful. I said, uh, where parents, both of them, were committed to God, took their children to church, they went to Sunday school, they were raised up in the house of God, they set the right example in the home, and they was faithful to the things of God. 93% of the children remained faithful when they grew up. If one parent was faithful, uh, uh, the figure dropped down to 73%. When both parents were only mediocre, faithful, only mediocrely faithful to the things of God, only 53% of the young people remain faithful to the things of God. And when both parents were only occasional attendees, the figure dropped down to 6%. You put it together. Those are statistics that actually work and that actually are really, are, are, are really happening. We need to understand uh, that we set the pattern. We set the pattern for our children. We set the pattern, dads and moms. We set the pattern for our wives, fathers, because we're the priest of the home. And then the fourth thing is we need to be the priest. We need to be the priest of our household. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our, uh, the, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And these words which I commanded you today shall be in your heart. 
You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk to them when you sit in the house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as signs on their hands and they shall be as frontals between their eyes and you shall write them on the doorpost and your house and on the gate. Whenever your children are coming up and going down, the word of God needs to be poured into their heart. That's what it's saying. The word needs to come alive within them. They need to see mom and dad in the word. They need to see mom and dad on their knees praying, seeking God. And they need to learn how to pray by listening. Mom and dad pray and talk to God. And pretty soon uh, the children will talk to God just like mom and dad does. Fathers, our responsibility is awesome. I said your responsibility as a father and dad is awesome. But let me tell you, it's so awesome you can't do it by yourself. I made up my mind when I first married Mickey and, and, and we had the responsibility of five children. I said to her, I said, honey, let me tell you something. If, you're gonna marry, if I'm going to marry you, we're going to church. Or we're going to serve God. Or we're going to give our life to the Lord. She didn't have a clue. She was a heathen. She didn't have a clue what I was talking about. So she thought, well, what's the big deal? We'll go to church one hour out of the week. Not knowing she spent her life in this place. <laughs> Not knowing that, that this man that she uh, this uh, this man that she married was going to have a call of God on his life, and God was going to call me into ministry and call her into ministry, and we would spend our life in the house of God, ministering to people and touching lives. But she made a commitment and said, "Yes, wherever my husband wants to do, I'll do it." Not even understanding. Our responsibility is awesome, but we need help. The Heavenly Father wants to enable you as fathers uh, that you can be the fathers that you need to be, that we can be great fathers, that we can be men of God, that we can be men of integrity, that we can set the example, and not only for our children, but our grandchildren. My job's not done because my children are married and got their kids. My job is still just as important as it was. Now I set the example for my grandchildren. I'm going to give you a checklist for fathers. If I had to change and do it again, can I tell you a few things I'd do? If I had to do it again, any of you fathers here uh, would, would say in your heart maybe, boy, if there's a couple of areas, there's some things in my family, maybe move with my wife, with my children, and now in retrospect, man, it'd be good if I could have another chance and, and I'd do it a little different. How many of you? All right. My hand's up too. If I had to do it again, number one, I'd love the mother of my children more. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wife even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. I would demonstrate my love for her in front of my children in a greater way. I'd seek to be faithful in doing little things to make life easy for her. How about opening the car door? How about placing her chair at the table when she goes to sit down? How about giving her little gifts on special occasions or writing her a love letter when she's gone from home? These little things count. These little things say, I love you and miss you. Every time this lady ever travels anywhere and comes home, she can almost count on the fact there'll be flowers on the counter, there'll be a card, there'll be her favorite perfume, and anything else I can think about to show her that this man loves her and misses her, and she's everything to me. Are you with me? I'd take her by the hand when we stroll through the park. I'd praise her in the presence of my children for all the things that she's done through the years uh, to make my life easy. My dad, I learned a lot of these things from my dad. He was an example. He was a pace setter for how to treat a woman. He knew how to treat my mother. I saw my dad treat my mom with integrity and caring for her and love her. And at the end, when she was dealing with Alzheimer's and having seizures about every, uh, about every three months and, 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 and it was affecting her life, he did everything. He, he, he did the dishes. He did the clothes. He cleaned the house. He, he paid the bills. And, and someone said, hey, George, isn't this a little tough on you? And here's what he said. He said, it's my pleasure to take care of my mommy. He called her his mommy. To take care of my mommy because she took care care of me for 60 years yeah. hallelujah number two I'd listen more most men find it hard to listen 
We're busy with the burdens of work. At the end of the day, we are tired. We need to learn to be listeners. And he, 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 even though oh, we do have a lot of pressures of our own, and I think sometimes uh, the wives and the women don't understand the pressures that men are under. We deal with pressures every day. I try to listen when my uh, child just shared his little hurts and complaints and what, it, uh, and what the little hurts were all about. I try to refrain uh, from words uh, of, and acts of impatience uh, leading to interruptions. Those times can be the best times to show love and kindness. I think I've always, uh, my particular, I was talking to my sister the other day. My sister took me out for Father's Day at breakfast and we was talking. And, 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 I, and I think ever since I was a, a, a little boy, I've, ha- I've always had a retention deficit. I don't have a, I can't hang in there very long. I can lose focus in a second. And Mickey's let me know for 40 years how that's one of my problems. So, Lord, help me. I wish I could have done better. Sweetheart, I'm going to try from now on to do better. (laughs) There's some people I just love to communicate with. Debbie's one of them right here. Have you ever ever spent time talking to Debbie? She glues her eyes on you. She's connected. She's listening to every word. And boy, you almost feel like she really cares about what you're talking about. (laughs) If you're faking it, just keep on, Debbie, because, man, you really let everybody feel good. You're a gem, girl. You're a gem. You're first class. One evening, a small boy tried to show his father a scratch that was on his fingers. Anybody still with me? He tried to show him a scratch that was on his finger. Finally, after repeating and attempting to gain his father's uh, attention, the father stopped reading his newspaper, and he rudely uh, said, uh, interruptedly, he says, well, what can I do about it? To the little boy. The little boy says, Daddy, you could have said, oh, or wow. You could have said something. Children don't want a great big fanfare. You don't have to take them and spend all kind of time fussing over them. Just let them know that you're listening. Let them know that you care. Let them know that you're interested. I would try to understand what my child says because I believe that the father who listens to his child when he's small will find that the child will listen to him when he's old. The third thing uh, that, I, that I would try to do is, is I would seek more opportunities to give my child feelings of belonging. Let them know they're special. That's the reason I tell you to tell the other people in the body of Christ, they're special. There's nobody made just like you. You're wonderfully and marvelously made. God has made you like nobody else in the world is made uh, like you. You're special. Psalms 127 and verse 3 it says, uh, it says uh, a son is the heritage of the Lord, and children is a reward from him. The fourth thing I would do is I would express words of appreciation and praise more. Fathers have a tendency, we came we come home tired, we've been working all day, we've been under the pressure of the load of all the things it takes, and we come home sometimes, and if we see some things that we've told our kids to do and they haven't done it, we jump right on them. But if they've done some of the things that we asked them to do, we ignore it. They need to be praised. They need to be told they did a good job. And I'll tell you, if we'll do that, you'll find out they'll always be connected and they'll honor and respect you. The fifth thing is I would spend more time together with my family. Ephesians 5, 16 tells us to make the most out of every opportunity because the days are evil. How many of you believe we live in evil days? Evil days. Days where things, uh, where, where, where things are, are serious and, and if we ever had a time to pour into our children, it's this day. The sixth thing is I would laugh more. I would spend more time, uh, I would spend more time being lighthearted. We all get too serious. We get too serious about our job. Sometimes we even get too serious about the things of God. How many of you know, if we're going to be a Christian, we need to be a happy Christian. Yeah. Proverbs 17, says, A merry heart does good like a medicine. 
But a broken spirit dries up the bone. And the seventh thing that I would do if, if, if I was going to have another opportunity uh, to, uh, to, to be uh, a great father, uh, the best father is the one who knows God as his heavenly father. Only Jesus Christ can provide uh, that relationship. That the child, like faith in Christ Jesus, will take us to the end of the road. I got to keep walking in him. I got to keep loving him. I got to keep my faith up. And I got to keep realizing that I can't do this alone. I can only do it through Christ Jesus. Hebrews 11, uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 7 tells us, By faith, Noah being warned of God, of things not seen yet, moved with fear, preparing the ark and saving his house, uh, by which he, commanded, uh, which he uh, c- commanded the world and became heirs of the righteousness by faith. We can go through uh, Hebrews 11 and we can see the mighty men of God that walked by faith and not by sight, that had their, had, had, that had their focus uh, out beyond where they were. Abraham and, and, and Noah and Joseph and the mighty men that walked in the things of God and showed us how, uh, how to be a great father. And I believe God wants us to be great fathers today. What, makes them, what made them great? First of all, they had a relationship with God. Second of all, they listened to the word of God. Third of all, they acted upon what God said. And then uh, they was willing to face opposition and stand for what God said and what they believed in. And then they looked beyond the now into the future and they knew that God has something better for them. Is anybody with me? Oh, listen, God wants us to be men. God wants us to be men that are great fathers and great men. Where's Tina at? Tina, I want you to read this little short closing thing I want you to hear. And this is called Walk a Little Plainer, Daddy. Listen, men. Walk a little plainer. Don't be complicated. Keep it simple. Walk a little plainer, Daddy, said a little boy so frail. I'm following in your footsteps, and I don't want to fail. Sometimes your steps are very plain. Sometimes they are hard to see. So walk a little plainer, Daddy, for... You are leading me. I know that once you walked this way many years ago, and what you did along the way, I'd really like to know. For sometimes when I am tempted, I don't know what to do. So walk a little plainer, Daddy, for I must follow you. Someday when I'm grown up, you are like I want to be. Then I will have a little boy who will want to follow me. And I would want to lead him right and help him to be true. So walk a little plainer, Daddy, for we must follow you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment. The most important thing that I can say to you this morning as we close this service is do you know Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, Lord, Master, and King? Are you a father that's made the decision as Joshua did, as for me and my house? I'm going to serve God. In this house right now, there's great fathers and great dads that have spent your life doing the best you can to be a provider, a protector. To take care of your family according to the word of God. I applaud you and I honor you. Maybe there's somebody here that don't know Jesus this morning. A woman or a child or a man that's slipped away. Maybe used to serve God. Used to walk with the Lord. But pressures of life and disappointments and heartbreak. Has taken the joy and the luster of Jesus out of your life. I hear a voice calling you home today saying my child come home like that prodigal son that went the way of the world and was unhappy until he came back to father's house if you don't know Jesus as your own personal savior would you give this pastor the privilege to pray for you if you're saved and you know the Lord but you've drifted away you've lost grip Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. 
David cried out in Psalms 51, O God, create in me a clean heart. Restore within me the joy of my salvation. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. In other words, bring me back to the place that I once knew and felt the power of God in my life. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus, you need to make a decision for the first time or you're willing to say, Lord, come back and take over my life afresh. Would you give this pastor the privilege to pray for you by lifting your hand right now and say, that's me, pastor. Is there someone here that needs to make a fresh decision? God bless you, brother. Is there somebody else by the uplift hand? Say, me too, pastor. We're not asking you to join the church. We're not going to ask you to get involved in anything except for get involved in Jesus and make him Lord of your life. That's all. Is there somebody else by the uplifted hand and say, I'm not where I should be, but this is Father's Day. It would be a great time to get it right. Father's Day would be a great time to come back home to Father's house. If that's you, raise your hand. I'm going to give you a minute. Raise your hand. If that's you. If you want, if you want special prayer, this pastor is going to pray for you this morning. Would you stand with me, everybody, in the house? I'm going to ask those that raised your hand, would you step out of the aisle right now? Meet me right here, because I'm going to pray with you. Meet Esmond. Hallelujah. Esmond, I'm going to ask you to step up here and pray for our brother, because I've got an altar call for the fathers, okay? So he's going to. You're going to get that breakthrough, man. You're going to get, that's the right decision. How many of you believe in this congregation? This message was not to uh, put a hammer on all the fathers and, and beat you down and tell you what you're do, doing wrong and tell you what you need to do to get right. This was not what it was about. This was about honoring you men that have made a decision, some of you many years ago, to make Jesus Lord of your life. And if I said some things out of my own experiences that will help you walk a little closer to him, then so be it. Because God wants us to be great fathers, not just mediocre, not just make it through, not just at the end of the road we can say, well, I, I guess I did all right. I want you to be able to say, I did my very, very best, and as for me and my house. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'd like to have the, the privilege of praying for every father and every dad and every man that has some, somebody un, under your authority that you're bringing along. And I would like to pray God's great anointing on your life if you'll come down to this altar. I'd like to ask every father and every man to come to this altar. And this is how we're going to close the service. Would you come? Would you come? We're going to believe God for men that'll make the difference for men that'll make the change you come you come you come hallelujah now if your man is standing down here and you believe in what he's standing for I want you to step out and come down here and get behind your man I want every wife, every woman to come down, stand with your man, work your way through the crowd and say, I'm coming in. Put your arms around him and say, I stand with you. That's for me and my house. We're serving the Lord, John, right? We're standing, buddy. We're standing. Len, that's for me, that's for me and my house, you and your house. We're standing. Richie, you've always stood as a man that showed the example of what it is to be a godly father. I appreciate you. I appreciate you men that have set examples. I look at George, Dr. Seymour, and his boy standing with him. It thrilled me the other day I, during the school thing. You went out in the lobby out here, and you and your son held each other and wept together because that's how important you are to your son because you set the example. Amen. It's good. It's good. That's good stuff. That's the right stuff. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want to pray over every, every marriage, every home, every man. And I want you to believe God. He's going to help you to be all that you need to be. Amen. Father, I pray 
over every man and woman that stands together, every family that's represented in this house. Lord, there's some young men here that if we were just going to base it on having children, then they wouldn't be standing here. But these are young men. Maybe they haven't had any children yet, but they've, they've poured themselves into other people and made a difference in their life. God, I pray right now that you'll give us the strength to continue to be what we need to be. Give us the strength to walk in integrity and anointing. Give us the strength to be an example to those watching us, starting with our own family. Give us the anointing and the strength to be godly men, godly fathers, godly husbands. And God, we just thank you that we have the privilege to be that. And we thank you you've imparted into us the word of God that will give us the instructions necessary. We, we're just not out there groping around and not knowing what to do. We've got your word. we got the power of the Holy Spirit. And we got your anointing that will cause us to walk in victory if we so desire. Bless each and every person, each and every one in this house. That God, that we can truly, we can be men of integrity. Men that count and make the difference. And Lord, we give you praise in Jesus' name. I want to have. I would like all the men, all the men say, "So be it." If you agree with that, and your wife and your and, and, and your loved ones next to you, turn around and give her a big hug and say, "I'm committed to you." Hallelujah! All right. Amen. Turn around and tell somebody they're special and you'll be dismissed. Anybody receive anything out of this sermon this morning? Anybody get anything out of this? All right. Tell somebody they're special. Happy Father's Day. Have a great afternoon.